Good morning and welcome to The Extra on KRDO News Radio Show that connects you with the topics and issues and people that are important to you and very important person here from Hammond Law Group, Jessica Showers, attorney at law. Is that how you say it? Yes, attorney at law. I felt so official, Jessica. Isn't it official? It sounds official. feels official. Right. Say it that way. And Jessica and I have already hit it off <laughs> because Miss Catherine, what, what, vacationing? My goodness. Yes. Well, a little time well in deserved. the sun. Yes, yes. Absolutely. Very well deserved. <laughs> absolutely. Well, thank you for coming in today. Thanks for having me. And I love it because today we are talking about, um, and I love talking with you guys because it's very educational, very informative, how to prepare. Um, and it can also apply just not when somebody passes in your family or preparing to pass. It can, it can apply to a lot of different aspects in life as well. Absolutely. So today we are talking about uh, steps to take when a loved one passes. And the steps, I was looking through them, Jessica, and it's like, okay, even if you know someone is going to pass mm-hmm. and you're preparing yep. or a sudden loss, right? always should be ready. Yes, absolutely. And I think it, it can be hard when we have a sudden loss, obviously, to prepare yeah. as much as we can. But the steps we're going to talk about today, I think, are applicable, whether we know somebody is going to be leaving us or they leave us very quickly without permission, I like to say. Oh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. I didn't give you permission to leave. Right. What do you think you're doing? (laughs) So let's hop right in because you have a lot of steps here to help everybody get ready. And again, I like all the, all of this stuff too can be applied, well, most of it. Also, like, let's start with step number one, take care of yourself. Absolutely. I think people forget to do that first and foremost. When we lose somebody, Things change. Our lives change. Our most change. And we really forget to just take some time to think about ourselves and also spend time with our family and friends and reminisce about that person and share stories and not forget them. We sometimes get so tunneled vision on, okay, I've got to close this account. I've got to call these people. I've got to get this. I've got to get that. Call the attorney. I've got to call the attorney. Yeah. Um, And what I tell families is, yes, I do want to hear from you, but we're probably going to schedule a meeting, you know, two or three, maybe even four weeks after your loved one has passed away to give you some time to do some other things that are more important, like spend time with your family, with your kids and with your aunts and uncles to hear those stories about the person that you just lost so that you can remember them. Because after you get through the other tasks, all you're left with are your memories. And those are so very important. Oh, incredibly important. And one thing that can happen is uh, communication can can kind of shut down a part of the grieving process. Yes. And be part of the grieving process. <laughs> yes. Was that a good way to put it? I think so. I think the the grieving process absolutely can cause us to close our lines of communication. And in some cases, what it can also happen to do is we stop talking to each other. Right. Um, if it's, you know, we lose a parent. So we have siblings who stop talking to each other and then start almost creating stories in their head as to what the other person is doing. Well, are they going into mom's house and taking pieces of property or did they call this person to get the important documents we need? Did they call the attorney before I had a chance to, instead of just talking to each other and saying, okay, these are the things that we know we need to do. Do we want to divvy up the list? Should I do it? Should you do it? And one thing I always mention to our clients who are in the pre-planning process, they're getting their estate plans together to leave to their family, have that conversation with your family now. Talk so talk to, to them. them now. Yes, about how you would like to see them work together when you pass away. My parents put their estate plan together and we all sat down, myself, my brother and the two of them, and talked through how this was going to look when they were no longer here so that my brother and I were absolutely on the same page moving forward. He knows what I'm going to be taking care of. He knows I'm going to be talking to him and having those conversations so that he doesn't feel somehow left out or has to wonder, hey, what's going on with this? We're already laying that foundation to keep communication open. Now, do you think it's a good idea, Jessica? And of course, it's, it's all a personal opinion for a family member. Yes. But to have a family member, the executor of the will, or do you think it's a better idea maybe to have a third party? You know, I think that really depends, Renee, on your family dynamic. For some families... It's doing it internally is the only way to do it because they don't really trust anybody, anybody out, outside. Right, right. For other families, when we have our conversations and we meet with them, we talk through those family dynamics. And in some cases, I have recommended, listen, let's not identify a family member. Let's make it a individual, maybe a professional trustee who I work with, or make it somebody else who's a trusted advisor to your family. But let's not make it the kids because they have a dynamic that's just going to be like oil and water no yeah. matter what we do and we don't want to cause that i've had clients say you know when we're gone they only have each other 
So we want to yeah. make sure that's preserved. And I like how you're saying, like, even with your family, like, this is, everybody knows this is what you're going to do. This is what your brother's going to do. It's laid out. Right, exactly. And it's communicated. Right. And even if that wasn't laid out by the person, you can still co- communicate and go, okay, Jessica, I'm going to call the attorneys on this day. Hey, if you would go look for the paperwork and get that together. I mean, kind of working like that, exactly. right? Exactly, right. And setting, I like to sort of do that and then also tell clients you want to sort of try to, for lack of a better word, manage expectations in terms of when things are going to get done. There's this desire to try and get everything completed right away, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. but they just passed a week ago. There's no need for it to be happening within 24 or 48 hours. You can give yourself some time to grieve, to share those stories, right? but you want to communicate that with your family so that they're not looking at you going, well, why didn't you get this done and tapping their watch and tapping their foot at you, which just adds to more anxiety for the person who's having to try and manage everything. Yeah, and manage everything. Yeah. It's extremely stressful. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Compounded by the grief of losing your loved one. Absolutely. Okay, we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to talk about uh, the next step in taking care of a loved one when they pass, being ready, being prepared. It's coming up on The Extra on KRDO News Radio. Welcome back to The Extra on KRDO News Radio. Today we're talking with Jessica Showers from Hammond Law Group. And we're talking about the steps to take uh, when a loved one passes. And this is kind of pre-steps, right? Yes. Pre-steps. This is if you know somebody might pass or even to be prepared if it's a sudden, like you said, dying without permission, passing without permission. Exactly. Which I really like. Yes. That's a good one. It softens the blow a little bit. It does soften the blow a little bit. (laughs) So the first step, talking about taking care of yourself, most people completely forget that. Yes. During this, it doesn't matter if you know the person is going to pass or not. It is still an extremely difficult time. But the next step is contacting the funeral home. And that can be very confusing and hard for people. It can. Absolutely. So the first thing you want to figure out, if there's any paperwork or anything to suggest that the person who passed away left any prearranged yes. idea of what they wanted. Or did they talk to anybody about, I want a public or a private funeral. I want to be buried or cremated. And hopefully they have written that down. It's not just, I told my kid you know, once upon a time that this is what I wanted and now something has changed. And making sure if there are prearrangements following that. Um, Some funeral homes, quite a few in town, actually will do a prearranged funeral. You can go in right now and set up your funeral, uh, pay for it, figure out what flowers you want, what music is going to play. Right, what music do you want? Uh, The joke in my family is... I'm allergic to lilies, so I always say I don't want lilies at my funeral. And my dad <laughs> said this might be the best time to have it because you're not going to know that they're there. So See, sometimes you have to laugh. Exactly, right. especially when you're dealing with this. Yeah. And so what's nice about doing a prearrangement for your family is they don't have to make any of the decisions. It's already made for them. Right. Uh, some people may have what's known as a funeral trust, so they've at least set aside some money to right. say when I pass away, this is what I want to have get paid for it. Right. And and, cause, and some people, I think, and correct me if I'm wrong, and you, of course, speak with a lot of families. Yes. The cost. Yes. It can be very expensive. It can. Depending on what you want to do. Right. And really where, that's probably the place that I see families overspend the most, especially okay. if nobody has told them what they want. So your family, you know, you pass away and your kids are looking at you and thinking, well, mom or dad deserves so much more. So let's give them a, a great send off. And you may be on the other side thinking, please don't spend the money on that. You know, I want you to spend it on other things. Right. So if you leave them some direction, they're not going to overspend on something that maybe you wouldn't have wanted them to do anyways. And well, like you said, if they set it up in the, in their will, in their, in their plan, plan, they can say, this is how much you're going to spend. Here's how much is allotted. Right. right, exactly. So if you have a funeral trust that says this is how much money I've put into it, then they know what that dollar amount is. And then hopefully you've also left some direction in terms of whether it's burial or cremation as to how you want to see that go and what kind of service do you want, if you want a service at all. Um, doing a prearrangement with the funeral home, they'll go through all of those steps with you. And then it's really just giving that packet to your family and saying, okay, if something happens to me, this is where my arrangements are already taken care of. You just call this number and they're going to take care of it. And everything's done. Exactly. Now, in the situation that arrangements haven't been made, again, this could go to the communication side of it. Absolutely. If communication isn't there and decisions haven't been made, then we're trying to figure out what kind of service are we going to have? What kind of flowers are we going to do? 
are we going to have food? Are we going to cater? And then who's going to pay for it? Mm -hmm. And how is that person going to get reimbursed? Lots of people will have life insurance policies that they'll say, well, my family can just use that. But it doesn't pay out right away. Exactly. It takes weeks, months. Sometimes to pay out. And the burial expenses are already due. So then it's a question of, are they going to get reimbursed? And who's and who in the family is going to take on that cost? Is it just going to be one person? Is it going to be multiple people? I've had people come into my office and they tell us a story of, you know, when my mom died, I took care of all the burial costs. My siblings didn't want anything to do with it. So I paid everything and there wasn't anything left over to reimburse me. So I just had to eat that cost. Yeah, yeah. So it's a good idea in your plan to get that prearrangement done or at least have specific, here's the amount. Yes. It's taken care of. Right. Yeah. Or at a bare minimum, write out what do you want? Mm -hmm. What kind of burial do you want? Where do you want to be? So that they at least have some of that starting information. Well, yeah, because for Aunt Sue to go, no, they want to be buried. And then Sister Lisa goes, no, they wanted to be cremated. That I mean, right. Uh, oh, that yeah. just start the just start the engines of fighting right there. Right. <laughs> Everybody's off to the races. Absolutely. <laughs> OK, and we're going to take a news break when and when we come back. And of course, Catherine and I talk about this a lot and the different types of paperwork. But it's very important, yes. I would say, especially as an individual. Yes. Know where the paperwork is. Have the paperwork readily, I mean, very accessible. Right. And we're going to talk about what paperwork should be ready, prepared, know where it is. And I know it's a hard conversation to have with your loved one, right? Right. But it's so important. But have it. Please have it. Yeah. (laughs) So important. Yeah. For for those of us that have lived through it, please have it. Please have it. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. We're going to take a quick news break. We'll come back with more steps to take when a loved one passes on the extra on KRDO News Radio. Welcome back to The Extra on KRDO News Radio. Today, we're talking with Jessica Showers from Hammond Law Group because, Catherine, I guess you want a little vacay. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. Well-deserved. Lucky, of course. Lucky (laughs) her. And today, we're talking about steps to take when a loved one passes. And as we've been talking about, this is, you know, maybe you are expecting someone to pass. Mm -hmm. Yep. Even if it's a sudden passing without permission. Right. Yes. There are things you need to do. And so the first step we talked about is take care of yourself. That's a good one. Keep that always in your mind. <laughs> and getting your funeral arrangements set up ahead of time. Yes, if If possible. not even the whole plan like done and paid for, at least laid out. Exactly. For family members to know. Right. So the next step in getting ready is identifying important paperwork and oh my Yes, there's a lot of it. There can be. Yeah. It, it just have it it's old file folder. Yes. Keep it. I don't know. I'm just I love <laughs> I love a file folder. I love a binder. Just something that you can point to so that your family knows, hey, if anything goes wrong and I get sick or when I pass away, everything you need is gonna be in this place. Right. In one one location. One location. Very helpful because when it's strewn all over the house, yeah, nobody knows where to look. No. And, and that's when you're pulling your hair out. Exactly. Yes. And yelling and screaming and it just becomes a huge mess. So what are some of the documents that should be in that file folder binder thing? Thing. So estate planning documents. So your last will and testament, if you have one, or if you have a revocable living trust, that document, you want to have that in there as well. The documents we talked about earlier about your arrangements for your funeral, you should have those in there. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would say also copies of, or at least some sort of, piece of paper or maybe an Excel spreadsheet or something that identifies what assets you have. Yeah. And where to find it. Yes. Where are your bank accounts? Which, which banks do you even bank with? Uh, Who holds your life insurance policies? If you have any, where are your investments held? Is it in Edward Jones, Charles Schwab? Do you have a financial planner who helps you with those? Taxes are a big one. Where are your tax documents so that your family knows whether or not you filed taxes the year before? because they probably aren't sitting over your shoulder and wondering if you file your taxes every year. Yeah. So you want to make sure that you know where those things are. And with those things, especially like the life insurance, the retirement accounts, do you have named beneficiaries? Because that trumps any legal document, doesn't it? It does. And it's so very helpful because it will keep that asset out of any sort of probate situation, Mm -hmm. any court situation, because the beneficiary designations directs the institution where to pay that money out to, to whom to pay it out to. So if you've listed that somewhere and you've got a copy of that beneficiary designation with your important paperwork, then your family's already a step ahead of the game. They can call Edward Jones and say, mom had a 401k account. This was her name. This is the account number. These are who we know her beneficiary designations are. 
Now, what I'll tell you is make sure that you've got your updated designations on there. Yeah, because that's, and people forget to call and update. They do, absolutely. They will forget to, maybe somebody's passed away, or I used to do family law, so when we had you know couples separate and divorce, they would forget to change their beneficiary designations. Mm-hmm. So make sure that if you've updated your beneficiary designations- It's in this- in that pile of paperwork. Okay. This is the newest one that I did so that everybody knows where that money should be getting paid to. Well, and again, I think most people don't realize that what is listed on that, say, 401k, that life insurance for the payout, the beneficiary trumps absolutely anything so, in the estate plan. Right. We've had situations where somebody has a will that says, I want everything to go equally to my kids. And then they have a payable on death beneficiary on their bank account. And that bank account's only going to one of the three kids. So that kid's coming out ahead. It's not going equally. Right. So you got to make sure that your designations all match up with your plan. Or if they don't, have some explanation as to why that's happening. Well, and I would imagine also passwords. Yes. that be a good thing to include in some? Yes. And some yeah. sort of, and um, there, there are all kinds of resources online. And I'm not a, a huge tech person. My husband's an IT guy, so he'd probably get mad at me to know that sometimes I have to write them down because there's so many passwords to remember. Right. But there are certain services online that you can use to lock all of your passwords so that your family can find those afterwards to get into things. So it's like one place where you put all the passwords and then they have access and a login to that one. Right, where necessary so that they can get some of that information to use for the online if they need to. But nothing as far as I'm concerned beats out old-fashioned you know, statements from time to time just to give your family direction as to where do you bank, who holds your insurance policies, where are those 401ks housed and who's managing for you. For you. Well, and another thing I know that probably gets it because it can be very confusing. Just correct me if I'm wrong, Jessica, but title to the house, who it goes to, right? Because that can get very complicated. It can get very complicated. Titles to properties, houses, vehicles. Okay. Very important that a copy of the title is with those important paperwork okay. as well so that we know, your family knows, is this owned in joint ownership? Did you own the property with one of your children? Did you own it with somebody else? Because if it's owned jointly, it's automatically going to go to that person, somewhat like the beneficiary designation. Okay. And it's not going to follow what the rest of your plan says to do. So that's another thing. And then, and this is, I mean, it's, I don't, you don't, you wouldn't think about this every day, right? Right. Bills. I mean, yes. bills. Yep. Make sure that. Subscriptions, right? Yes. Like, what bills are we paying? Who are they coming right. from? We don't think about that every day. We don't think about the bills that we have to pay. We just know we have to pay them, right? Lots of us use auto pay. And so mm-hmm. we just don't have to think about it anymore. But our families are going to need to know where those bills are coming from and what those expenses are. Because when you pass away, they still have a responsibility to pay some of those. Right. Pay your last expenses. All of a sudden, I'll pass due notice, start showing up. and Right. And they will start calling. Yeah. Sometimes they will call even before you have an opportunity to let them know that they've passed away. The credit card companies will call and say, hey we found out that this person passed in, we need payment. So what's going on with the estate? And you're still trying to figure out the fact that you've just lost your loved one. And how about social security as well? That's got to be really confusing. It can be very confusing. One of the things that is nice is that most funeral homes will contact social security themselves and let social security know that the person has passed away. Uh, We also provide for our clients a list of other places that we think you should call to let them know that your loved one has passed in order to stop people from stealing identities. Yes. Because that can also happen. Right. Which is very scary. Yes, absolutely. And should this, um, should this particular thing, who who gets what? And I'm talking about physical things because- does that go in the actual estate plan or should that go in a piece of paper? I mean, we don't want people fighting over a nightgown, right? We don't. And right? we really don't want people fighting over personal property. And in all honesty, it's the thing most people will fight about because most of us can do basic math. So we'll see an account and go, okay, if we're going to split that equally, we know how to do that. But when we look at stuff in a house, we don't know how to split that equally. Right. So I always recommend that either you've committed it to the estate plan, so it's written out so it is in your in will. There. Okay. Or in some cases, what we do is we have a reference to what's known as a personal memorandum that our client can write out and say, this is the list of personal property and where I want it to go. And the reason we do it that way is because if that list changes, we don't want them to have to come in every time every they make single a change. Time. Yeah. They'd really not want to see us anymore. So we say, write out the list. If you change it, just write a new list, sign it and date it. 
And the plan always refers to that memorandum. Okay. And then that memorandum just goes in this pile of documents. Right. With the plan that says, this is where I want personal property to go. And the other thing I would add to that memorandum is at the end, you say, okay, once everybody's received what personal property they want, tell your family how to get rid of the rest of the things that are in the house, whether that's donated. Donated, estate sale. Exactly. Okay. Give them some direction. Perfect. Yeah. So have everything in one (laughs) One place. place. Yes. Now, would you recommend... Um, and it's all per- personal preference again, but maybe a safety deposit box to keep everything in a pla- one right. place or... I think, again, personal preference, you're absolutely re- right, Renee. It depends on that. Safety deposit boxes are great. What I always tell people is check with your bank and find out if, let's say, you put everything in a safety deposit box and your eldest son is going to be the one who's going to manage things after you pass away. Mm-hmm. What does the bank need now while you're alive from your eldest son to, to know, get him? To release it to Exactly. Him. Okay. Because safety deposit boxes can be the hardest thing to get into. Oh. And so you want to make that step easy for your family if you can do it. Otherwise, a safe in the house works really well. Something that's secure uh, so that, you know, people don't just start taking things off the bookshelves if you get broken into or something like that. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to take a quick break. And when we, when we come back, we will talk about uh, consulting with a probate attorney. You got and it. That's coming up on the Extra on KRDO News Radio. Welcome back to the Extra. And today we're talking with Jessica Showers. She's an attorney at law. Jessica, it's so formal to say that. It is formal, isn't it? At Hammond Law Group. And we've been going through the steps to take when a loved one passes. Again, if you know that they may be sick and may be passing or even how to be prepared uh, for someone who suddenly passes and just being ready. Right. Because it's a sh- it's, it's a shock. Anyway, it's a shock to your system. And Absolutely. Your life, everything. Yep. And you and I were kind of talking in break and I have actually had long conversations with Catherine about this too. And it's about probate, pro- going into probation, probate attorneys, Yep, speaking with them. It's something you need to be ready with because there's only very few circumstances where an estate will not go to probate. Exactly. So it's very limited. Probate is not necessary in a situation when the person who passes away, they don't own any real property in their name. Their assets are under $66,000 mm-hmm. or maybe they all have beneficiary designations on them. Or in some cases, if their assets are titled in the name of a living trust, they will not have to go through probate. Okay. Otherwise, probate is necessary whether or not you do or don't have a will. And that's just something you have to be ready for. It just be, and I think what the misconception, tell me if I'm wrong, no. but the misconception is people think, oh, there's a will. I don't have to go through that. And that's not the case. Absolutely. It's the biggest myth out there that we get all the time. People say, well, I have a will. I don't have to go through probate. Incorrect. If you own a house and it's only in your name and you have a will, house still has to go through probate. Now, the good step is, is that your will says where you want your house to go. Right. So you're not relying on state law to distribute your assets. You've written out your wishes. So it's a step ahead of the curve, I like to say. Absolutely. But it's still going to require a probate action in order to get that house out of your name and into the name of the person you want to leave it to. And it's not just the house, right? Can it be other stuff? It can. So bank accounts, um, in some cases- Life insurance, would that be- If it doesn't have a beneficiary designation, it could potentially be going to the estate. And even we've had some like brokerage accounts or things like that, Mm -hmm. you know, high value. They're over that $66,000 threshold. Mom just never got a beneficiary designation on there. And so in order for it to get to kids, like her will says to do- Got to go through probate. And how do you know when you need to actually speak with a probate attorney? I think you, best thing to do is gather those important paperwork that we Mm -hmm. talked about. And even if you're not sure, once you've got the idea of that paperwork and you have a good idea of what those assets are, set an appointment with a probate attorney, have a consultation. It may be, I've met with clients numerous times. We sit down, we look at everything and I tell them, you don't have to go through probate. You have, you know, mom and dad did everything they needed to. You've got designated beneficiaries. Yes, call this person, do this, but you're not going to have to go through a probate action. And I actually really like having those meetings because you get to give some good news to people in a situation where they've had a shock. And so, and then, but I bet it's hard when they realize oh no, just there's some stuff that has to go through probate. Yes, it some can certainly things go can the get, other way. <laughs> things can get confused kind of, and I don't want to say easily, but I mean... But quickly. Yes. Yes, they can get confusing very quickly. So yes, we've certainly had meetings where you know they'll come in with the same thing, the important paperwork, the outline of those assets, and we're looking at them and they think, well, mom said that she was leaving the brokerage account to both of us equally. 
but there's no designated beneficiary. So that's going to have to go through probate in order to get to you. And it just, it just, it, all of it emphasized why there's, it's so important to have a plan, yes. protect you, your family. Absolutely. Communicate and all that. And that's why I love uh, that we go through all this stuff and because it all can be applied to other <laughs> areas in life. Exactly. Okay, Jessica, we're going to have to wrap up, but I know you guys always have, it's once a month, right? Right. It is basically the beginning steps to estate planning. Absolutely. It's just about wills and trusts and what are our options and what are the things that we should know going into this planning process. And we have them once a month. We have them coming up in April, April 3rd and April 7th. And they're a great uh, learning tool. Uh, it's a really like a class, a workshop for us to give information and answer questions for people who are starting on this path of, okay, I know I need to get a plan into place. Where do I even start? Right. Okay. And where are, where can, do they have to make reservations, right, for the workshops? Right. Make them online. We have them on our website. They're listed in terms of where their locations are. Uh, this month, we're in a couple of different places and I don't quite have them committed to memory. Okay. But they are available on our website. They can be a, a you can register online and you can also call our office to register as well. Okay. And do you know the website off the top of your head? Uh, ColoradoEstatePlan.com. Okay. Perfect. Well, thank you so much. Lots of great tips. And thank it was you. great. It was great meeting you. Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Renee. Well, now you're gonna have to tell Catherine, like, well, if you want me to go in. Yeah. <laughs> it's totally fine. Renee and I get along great. <laughs> I get along with everybody, Jessica. All right, well. Don't let the rumors get out there. Okay, no. I won't. I won't tell anybody. Just us. <laughs> Coming up tomorrow on The Extra, an incredible uh, collaboration, if you will, between the Pikes Peak International Hill Climb and Winslow BMW. You are not going to want to miss this. They're going to be on the show tomorrow to talk about it. And trust me, if you are artistic in any way, shape, or form, you're going to want to listen. That's tomorrow on The Extra on KRDO News Radio.